And so we're going to do a two-part series, which is entitled, It Is Written. And part number one is entitled, The Bible Came From God. The Bible Came From God. Now, I'm going to give you a, for all you note takers out here, I'm going to give you a lot of scripture today. And the reason why, because I want you to understand what the Bible says about itself. Now, there are a lot of questions floating around about the Bible, such as, can we trust the Bible? Uh, who wrote the Bible? Or how about how did we get the Bible? And this is one that comes up a lot, is, is the Bible a tool to control people? And you can probably tell me some uh, of those of questions, too. You can probably give me many more questions about what you've heard about the Bible or what you've seen on social media. Uh, so my goal this morning in this short series today and next week is to help us get some understanding about the Bible. Because here's the thing, the better you understand the Bible, the more confidence you will have in it when you read it and you study it. And you'll be able to answer questions that you encounter in conversations with your family and with your friends. I've come to understand and come to believe that when someone asks a question, that they're looking for an answer. Even if they ask that question jokingly or in sarcasm, I believe they still are looking for an answer. And so we as believers must be equipped on how to answer questions that come from our friends and our family. And so our text this morning helps us to understand and gives us some answers to some of those questions that we're facing today. And to help us get a broader understanding of the verse we read, it helps to know the context of the letter of 2 Timothy. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he is in jail. He, he's in a Roman dungeon, and he's awaiting execution. Uh, this letter, 2 Timothy, is the last letter before he dies. He's writing this letter to this young man who, who he has trained and who he has mentored and who he has discipled in the faith as well as in church leadership. Uh, their bond, the Bible tells us, is, is so strong that Paul even calls Timothy his son in the faith. That he has trained this young man, he has developed this young man, and now he is writing to him and sharing with him some of his experiences that he has gone through in life and some of his experiences in ministry. It's good when people can tell you where they've been. It's good when people can let you know this is what I've gone through. And matter of fact, this is even what you have seen me go through. And you have seen God bring me through. So you too need to be encouraged. In the letter, the, uh, Paul reflects on, as I said, his ministry and his life. He, he's, he's encouraging Timothy and he's warning him and instructing him on how to live for God and how to lead the church as he is the bishop in the city of Ephesus. It's interesting now because when you read chapter 3, it opens with the Apostle Paul warning Timothy about what's going to happen in the last days. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 1 and 2, lets us know that we are right now in the last days. Now understand, we're not in the tribulation period. We're not in the great tribulation period, but we are in the last days. The Bible tells us how the last days began with the ministry of Jesus, and it will end at his second coming. Not the rapture, but his second coming. He warns Timothy about what he needs to be on the lookout for as he lives in this last day. And how we too need to be on the lookout for some of the same things in these last days. And he says, Timothy, you need to stay away from this stuff. The same way, church, you need to stay away from some stuff if you want to follow Jesus correctly. And so I encourage you to take some time to read verses 2 through 5 because it gives 18 behaviors and attitudes that we need to stay away from. Basically, the list tells us that there are some people who care nothing about God. They are lovers of themselves. They are boastful, they are blasphemous, they are greedy, and they do not love God. The only thing they care about is themselves. 
which is one of the reasons why people challenge the Bible. What it lets us know is that people want to do what they want to do, and they don't want anyone or anything to tell them not to do what they want to do. So therefore, they try to disprove the Bible so that they don't have to change their thoughts and change their lives. And some of those people, understand now, they're just not out in the world. Some of those people are even in church. They, they live the way they want to live with disregard for the Bible. They don't care what the Bible really says. As verse 5 says, they have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Which means is they have this appearance of wanting to live holy, a, 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 a appearance of wanting to do right but never actually do right. They have an appearance of following Jesus, but their lives never change. Listen, I don't just want to look like I'm holy. I want to be holy. I don't want to just look like I'm following Jesus. No, I follow Jesus. I'm not perfect, but I'm following him. They have this appearance of uh, being a disciple, but their lives never change. As verse 7 tells us that they're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They, they're always reading the Bible and reading books about the Bible and reading other books about spiritual topics, but never getting to the place where they actually do what the Bible says. And it shows in the way they live and in their mixed beliefs. See, that's why you don't need to go out and read all these different books and all these different holy books when you don't even understand your book. Right? I, it, it confuses me. When people go out and say, I don't, I don't know if I want to understand the Bible or not, or I'm trying to understand the Bible, but then I want to understand the Quran and understand all these other books. But you don't even know the 66 books. You can't even quote any of the names of the books. But you want to go out and study other books. Another reason why some people don't value the Bible is because they see people who say they believe in Jesus and who are reading the Bible and quoting the Bible, and their lives are just as raggedy as theirs. And they say, why do I need to read the Bible when your life is just as messed up as mine? Why do I need to read the Bible and you drink just like I drink? We at the same club every weekend. Why do I need to read the Bible if you doing the same thing I'm doing? You sleeping around on your wife, you sleeping around on your husband, but you want me to read the Bible. I'm cool. And so Paul says now, he warns Timothy. He says, Timothy, be on the lookout for false teachers. The apostle writes in verse 13, he says, be on the lookout for people who are trying to deceive and manipulate people. He says, these evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So there are people who will blame the Bible and try to discredit the Bible because of evil men. Because they hear false teaching and they see people trying to deceive people, so they will try to discredit the Bible. A very prevalent question that comes up, especially in the black community, is how can you be a Christian and believe the Bible when slave owners use the Bible to control people. If you've been on any type of social media, you have seen or heard this question. And it will bring verses up like Ephesians 5 and 5. Slaves obey your earthly masters. Uh, my first answer to that question is, just because slave owners used the verse out of context to control people, does not mean that the Bible is not true. The Bible, listen to me, the Bible is against people stealing other people and forcing them to be in slavery. And that is what happened at the transatlantic slave trade. People were stoled and forced to be into slavery. The Bible is against that. 
In the Old and in the New Testament, it's against it. Listen to what the Old Testament says in Exodus 21 and 16. God says, he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. That don't sound like an affirmation of slavery to me. The New Testament, 1 Timothy 1 and 10 says, the Bible tells us how the law of God, the word of God, is against kidnappers. The King James will call them men stealers. That is forced slavery. The Bible is not pro-slavery. The Bible is not pro-slavery, especially in the sense of slavery that was practiced in the Americas. Now, yes, there was slavery that was, it's in the Bible. Yes, there was slavery in the first century. But for a large portion of that, it was basically those people being indentured servants. Matter of fact, people would sell themselves into slavery so that they could live. And for the most part, Slavery was only for a period of time, not like in America where it was for life. That's why you can look at Leviticus 25 where it talks about the year of Jubilee. How every 50 years the slaves would be liberated. Because God wanted the Jews to understand, listen, this is not about people indebted to you. You are brothers and sisters in Christ. So even if they owe you something, after 50 years release those people. Now, the same question can be asked about women. Uh, they'll say, well, how can you be a Christian? How can you believe the Bible when men have used the Bible to oppress women? My answer, first, is the same as the question to slavery. Just because men use the Bible out of context to oppress women does not mean that the Bible is not true. Matter of fact, the Bible says that men and women are both created in the image and likeness of God. Genesis 1.28. So therefore, men and women have value. Men and women have dignity. Now, the Bible does say that men and women have different roles. The Bible does say... How a man can do one thing and a woman can do another. Such as how only a man can be a husband. And how a woman can only be a wife. But that is not to oppress anyone. That is to liberate people so that we can be able to fulfill and flourish in the bodies he has given us. And so people using the Bible out of context does not mean that the Bible is false. What it means is they're false teachers. What it means is that their doctrine is wrong. It does not mean that the Bible is wrong. So here's the thing. If you preach and you teach, do not teach what you want the Bible to say. Teach what the Bible says. Don't preach your doctrine that you get from your denomination or your pet scriptures. Preach what the Bible says. Preach the whole counsel of God or don't preach at all. Because in James 3 and 1, the Bible says, teachers shall receive a stricter judgment. People want to get up. Oh, I'm called to preach. I say, okay, understand now. You're going to be judged. Not just like regular Christians, but you have a stricter judgment. Oh, I want to be a pastor. That's good. That's great. But understand, you're going to have a stricter judgment because you're teaching people how to follow God and not just following God by yourself. Understand, you called to preach, praise God. You called to teach, praise God. But your judgment will be stricter. So preachers, teachers... Don't teach the wrong stuff because you will be held accountable. Even though churches may not hold you accountable, God will hold you accountable. As well as Christians, we shouldn't be spewing out all these verses. Every time you get into a conversation, somebody bringing a verse up. And here's the thing, many of them are bringing the verse up out of context. 
right? And they don't even know what the chapters say, but they got their verse, right? And they're trying to win their argument. So they bring up this verse to try to prove their point and disprove. Or, and then people say, well, that ain't even what the Bible actually means. So here's the thing. Be careful because you can lead people astray too. And not just false teachers and false preachers, but also Christians who tell the word out of context can lead someone astray. So therefore, we need to read and study the Bibles for ourselves. As I say, just don't listen to me and go home and be like, oh, yeah, this is how I'm going to live my life now. Because, you know, Pastor Steve, he nice. He tell nice jokes. So I'm going to just do what he say. No. No, read the Bible for yourself, right? That's why you need to have pen and paper so you can take notes, so you can go back and check what I have said. Do not just take my word for it. Read it for yourself. And in reading it for yourself, you actually get a better understanding of what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul, he gives Timothy in our text a very clear and explicit statement about where the Bible came from, its origin, as well as what it's for, its purpose. Uh, the beginning of portion, the beginning portion of verse 16, listen to what it says. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Th that word inspiration, it means divinely breathed. That all scripture is breathed out by God. Another way to say it is that all scripture came from God. God, that the Bible originates with God himself and not with people, that God used men to write and to speak his words. As 1 Peter chapter 1, 21 tells us, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So here's the thing. So through the Holy Spirit, God reveals himself and his plans to the writers of the Bible. All the words in the Bible came from God to specific people who wrote it from their own personal and historical and cultural context. So God gave the men the words to say, and then God divinely allow them to use their own context where they were from, use their own historical setting where they were from, and allow them to even use their own personality to write down the words that came from God. So God used people to write down his words. So the words in the Bible did not come from the subconscious of men it didn't come from the mind of men it came from the mind of God God told people what to write down and so verse 16 again says all scripture is given by inspiration of God so all of it came from God that's the old and the new testament all of it so understand now within the context of Paul's writing of verse 16, he is specifically now talking about the Old Testament. All 39 books inspired by God. The words came from God. And here's the thing. The Old Testament was the first century church's Bible. So the Old Testament is quoted over 800 times in the New Testament. In those 27 books, you see the apostles referring back to the word of God in the Old Testament to let them know this is what God says and this is how we are to live as followers of Jesus. And then we even see in the New Testament, while the New Testament writers are writing letters, we see the apostles saying how the New Testament letters are also scripture. Like the second Peter chapter 3 verses 15 and 16 where the apostle Peter is talking about the letters of the apostle Paul. And he is telling uh, us about the letters of Apostle Paul. And he says, listen, there are people who are trying to twist Paul's writings, trying to twist his teaching, just like they do the rest of the scriptures. Now, listen to what he's saying. He's saying 
just like people are trying to twist Paul's writing, is the same way they try to twist the rest of the scriptures. So therefore, Paul's writing is on the same level as the rest of the scriptures. He says, matter of fact, when you look at Paul, when Paul is writing, he quotes in 1 Timothy 5, 18, he quotes not only from the Old Testament, but from the New Testament. Listen to what he says. He says, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. And the laborer is worthy of his hire. All right, so the first part of that scripture, right? The first part, not muzzling an ox. That's from the Old Testament, all right? Deuteronomy 25 and 4. The second part, the laborer is worthy of hire, comes from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 10, verse 7. Jesus is saying this. So Paul is saying the writings of Luke are equal to the writings of the Old Testament. They are both inspired by God. They are both coming from the mouth of God. Therefore, all Scripture, old and new, came from God. The words came from God to men to write down. So therefore, you can trust the Bible. Amen. Therefore, you can rely on the Bible because the Bible is trustworthy because it's not based on the opinions of men, but on the words of God, right? So everything God says is true. Let me give you some scriptures. Deuteronomy 32 and 4, it says God is the God of truth. John 14 and 6 says Jesus is the truth. 1 John 5 and 6 says, the spirit is truth. And then John 17 and 17, Jesus says, thy word, thy scriptures is truth. So here's the thing. Our God is truth. And everything he says is truth. So therefore, as Titus 1 and 2 says, God cannot lie now to say that you don't believe in the inspiration of the bible to say that you don't believe that god gave the words to the men is to say that you don't trust god it is to say that god has lied and his word is a lie now another question that people have about the bible they say well how can you believe the bible when there's so many contradictions in the bible the Bible contradicts itself. I'm going to give you a good example. A good example is the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. The genealogies, they have different names. But both of them say that they are the genealogy of Joseph, who is Mary's son, who is the earthly father of Jesus. But upon further research, we find out that Mary and Joseph descended from King David. Matthew's genealogy traces the line of David's son Solomon down to Joseph, Matthew 1 and 6. And Luke's genealogy traces the line of David's third son Nathan down to Mary, Luke 3 and 31. So here's the thing. The issue is not that the Bible contradicts itself. The issue is people don't understand Jewish tradition, and they don't understand the Bible. They get tripped up on Luke 3 and 23 because it associates the lineage of Joseph. But when you read both genealogies, you see how they give different names for the father of Joseph. In Luke 3, 23, Heli is the father of Mary. So therefore, he is the father-in-law of Joseph. In Jewish tradition, no matter who the line was, they traced it back through the father. So a better way to say Luke 3.23 is to say that Joseph is not the son of Heli. He is the son of law of Heli. So the so-called contradiction is not a contradiction at all. What it is is people don't understand the Bible. 
What it is is that people don't understand Jewish tradition and culture. And so we see how the Bible was originated. We see that the words came from God to men to write down. God inspired it. But the last portion of verse 16 and all of verse 17 tells us the purpose of the Bible. Listen to what it says in verse 16. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. When I was studying this, I came across something by Dr. Warren Wiersbe. He, he gives us a simple and helpful definitions for these four purposes. He says, doctrine, it teaches us what is right. Reproof teaches us what is not right. Correction teaches us how to get right. And instruction in righteousness teaches us how to stay right. You want to know what's right? You want to know what's not right? You want to know how to get right? You want to know how to stay right? Read the Bible. Read the right book. The fifth purpose of the Bible is in verse 17. It says that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible gives us knowledge and understanding on how to do every good work. The Bible tells us how to live for God. The Bible tells us how to obey what he has told us to do. So therefore, the Bible is just not so that we can get a whole bunch of information. The Bible isn't just so that we can get our heads full of knowledge and then go out and spew it to everybody. The Bible is there so that we can get the knowledge so that we can obey. The Bible is given to us so that we can learn about God and so that we can obey God. The last purpose is in verse is number six, which is in verse 15 of First Timothy chapter three. Listen to what it says. It says the Holy Scripture, which are about which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Understand the Bible shows us that we need salvation. The Bible shows us that we all of humanity needs God's salvation, which is only provided through Jesus the Christ. The Bible shows us that we are all sinners destined for hell and we need a savior. The Bible tells us that without Jesus, who is the savior of the world, we are destined for the wrath of God. It is the Bible that tells us that Jesus is the one who died on the cross so that he would take our place and he received the wrath of God. It's the Bible that tells us that not only was he on the cross, but that he was buried in a borrowed tomb and that he came back to life three days later and he now reigns and sits at the right hand of the Father. The Bible tells us that. And the Bible tells us that we need to believe that by faith. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Romans 10 and 9. The Bible says that. So the Bible says if you obey the Bible and believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. What you can do right now. Today, you can obey what the Bible says. Today, you can escape hellfire and brimstone. And today, you can enter into a relationship with a loving Father. I encourage you, give your life to Jesus this morning. Repent of your sin. Just ask for forgiveness. And believe the gospel that God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, to shed his blood, to be buried, and to come back to life three days later. And confess him as your Lord and your Savior. Make him the Lord of your life and salvation will be yours. If you want to give your life to Jesus, I just ask you to say a prayer with me. Let us bow. Father, 
in the name of Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. Father, I believe you sent Jesus. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he came back to life three days later. Jesus, I make you my Lord and my Savior. Now, Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. Father, I pray that you help us to trust your word. I pray, oh God, that you help us to understand how to live by your word. That your word is not there just so that we can learn more about you, but your word is there so we can learn more about you so that we can obey you. Father, I pray that you give us a desire to want to study your word so that we can share your word accurately with our friends and our family. I pray, oh God, that you will help us to answer the questions that we face in everyday conversations. I thank you for what you're going to do. And I give you glory and honor in this place. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.